Well, uh, some time ago, I was probably a bit late to the game, but I watched the film named Troy. And uh, it's a film loosely based on Homer's The Iliad. And maybe it's a pastoral thing, or maybe it's just me, but some of my first thoughts about that film were about the way the script writers portrayed the gods. Because for several of the main characters in the film, uh, the gods of Troy and Greece were no gods at all. Irrelevant. Powerless. And while many Christians would not have a problem with the irrelevancy of the gods of Troy and Greece, I sort of wondered if that mindset is sort of reflective of the way many in our society view our own God as irrelevant, uh, not there. It just seems to be the pervading thought these days that God is largely absent. And when we face the facts, uh, the, our society has been affected by the scientific world and its ideas of cause and effect that won't allow for the supernatural and even our so-called soft sciences like uh, sociology and anthropology, they, people who work in those fields would tend to tell us that religious thoughts are just uh, wishful thinking. And there'd be not a few who would argue against the existence of God simply because they can't see God, like the medical student who said that he had dissected many bodies and never come across a soul. <laughs> this general mindset, it's, it's led, what shall I call him, that marvelous source of theological wit, George Carlin, to say this, I'm not an atheist, I'm not an agnostic, I think I'm an acrostic, the whole thing puzzles me. Now, but what makes this, this, this question of knowing God so acute, however, is the claim by some people to actually know God and to actually know God very well. A couple of thousand years ago, the Apostle Paul, as we've heard, wrote words which um, Daniel Whittle turned into the chorus of a hymn which we'll sing at the end of the service. And in the older version of the Bible, they read, I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. But it's not just apostles and hymn writers that uh, make this claim, I know whom I have believed. I still remember uh, sitting in awe one time. I got a new book uh, many years ago now, written by uh, a theologian by the name of J.I. Packer. And um, on the first page of the book, he was talking about some of the work of theologians that he knew. Uh, and their work was such that faith seemed to be optional. And he said himself, in his approach, um, uh, aside from them, by saying this, I know God. That he actually knows God. And some of us are much more comfortable if we would say, well, I think I know God, or I feel that I know God, but Packer just lays it right out there. I know God. And it's extraordinary, really, to say that. To be certain. It's staggering. And perhaps it's especially staggering for um, churchgoers who uh, still aren't quite sure or in some ways are still searching. And, and quite a number have shared with me over the years that they hope that there's a God, that God will be there for them at, at the end. They're not sure, but they're hopeful. And so for those who aren't quite sure, 
I thought about the words of uh, a great English preacher named Dr. William Sankster, and he gave us something to think about a number of years ago when he was pondering whether we could actually know God. And he said that he thought that God could be established and our ability to interact with, with God could be established by religious experience. He said, if we can answer three questions affirmatively, then they're good evidence that people may actually know God. And the three questions are this. Are the people who claim to have fellowship with God sufficiently numerous for us to believe that all human beings might know God? Second question. Are the witnesses, these people who report this, dependable? And the third question, are their reports mutually consistent? So if we look at those in turn, are the reporters who claim to know God numerous? And numerous enough to believe that all human beings, the average person, can, can know God. Well, you see, there's some things in this world that... Um, they are so rare that they really don't have um, a lot of significance for the rest of us. And maybe if I can use another film, you may remember the film A Beautiful Mind from 10 or 12 or 15 years ago. A Beautiful Mind. And the main character in there, John Nash, an incredible, incredible mathematician. He unfortunately suffered from paranoid schizophrenia as well. But his mathematical mind was brilliant. He got a Nobel Peace Prize for uh, economic theory in 1993. Um, minds like that, or minds like Albert Einstein, they do occur in the world, but they're sort of rare. And so their capacities won't tell us a whole lot about the capacities of most of us. What we want to talk about here is ordinary people. Is religious experience, is is the, the, are the people who claim to have knowledge of God, are, are they part of the common average person? That So much so that we ourselves could say, well, yeah, we could have that too. And the fact is that there are, there are many, many, many ordinary people who are out there who claim to have the presence of God in their lives. I have a, a friend... Uh, who is very well educated in science, very well read, has a keen mind, and uh, from time to time he'll send me some of his writings on the nature of God and ask for comment. And they're incredibly deep for um, someone who works in science and who isn't trained really in theology. Um, but he's open to all kinds of ideas about God, uh, he isn't what we would call orthodox by any sense. Um, he's not sure that the human mind can really define God. Um, but he is very sure that God exists. And very sure, so sure, that he'll openly say, I talk to him as I go about my daily activities. And so sure that he goes to church on Sundays at the Presbyterian church. Now, I'm not sure he would be totally classified as ordinary, but he's an example of Christians who go to church and claim to have knowledge, at least some, of God. And if we are to multiply that out and think about the people in the various churches that claim to know God, you begin to get an idea of significant numbers. Think about all the people in the United Churches across this nation who might say that they know God. Add in the Lutheran churches, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, the Anglicans, the Roman Catholics, Orthodox churches, Evangelicals. And across this land you have thousands and thousands, maybe millions of people who would claim to know God. Reginald Bibby did a study about 25 years ago in which he started looking and asking people questions about um, their level of church attendance and that sort of thing. He found out back then that about 30 percent of Canadians went to church regularly. It's much lower than that now. Let's say it's 10 percent. And let's say that 
of those 10% that go to church, there'd be a decent portion of them would say that they know God and that they have a relationship with God. And if you start to think about that, you wind up with probably a million, a couple of million in Canada. Then you start to think about the other countries, the United States, multiply that number by 10 or more. Start to think about South America, start to think about Europe and other continents, and you begin to find out that the answer to Sangster's question is, are there lots of reporters of this? The answer is yes. There are lots of people who claim to know God. Well, Sangster's second question is, are these people dependable? And uh, are these witnesses dependable? Well, we're perhaps aware of some people that will sell us on anything. Some people who will say anything to make a buck or to, uh, to sell you on something. But uh, there may be one or two or some in that group uh, that we've been describing, uh, that big group that, that say they will know God. But I'm not sure there'd be a lot. And um, are they dependable? Are they dependable? There are people in that group who are plain, ordinary folk, but they're, they're some of the greatest people that the world knows. Now, during this uh, presidential inauguration this past week, I started thinking about other presidents, and I was thinking about presidents that I like. And, um, um, sorry, that shouldn't... <laughs> um, and... Um, it's, uh, yeah, okay, that'll get me sidetracked. Anyway, I, presidents that I like, and he may not have be that popular with everybody, but one that I liked was President Jimmy Carter. There he is. And, um, you know, he is a highly educated man. He's getting on in years now, but he's also salt of the earth kind of guy who came from relatively humble circumstances in Georgia. He's honest. And out of office, Jimmy Carter will take his turn cutting the grass at his local Baptist church. And out of office, he, he does some amazing things. He, before office and after, he teaches Sunday school. And out of office, he goes and he hammers nails with um, a Habitat for Humanity. He's one of their premier spokesman now. Jimmy Carter, he's, he's a man of, of high character. And he says that he, he knows God. Look at those words up there. Beautiful words. Think of Mother Teresa. Here's another person who came from humble beginnings and engaged in work to help people um, with even less than she had on the streets of Calcutta. And that this ordinary woman takes up an extraordinary mission. Mother Teresa, it was all because she felt a call from God. And Mother Teresa wrote this. Dear Jesus, help me to spread your fragrance everywhere I go. Flood my soul with your spirit and love. Penetrate and possess my whole being so that, uh, my whole being so utterly that all my life may only be a radiance of yours. Shine through me and be so in me that every soul I come in contact with may feel your presence. Let them look up and see no longer me, but Jesus. Stay with me, and then I shall begin to shine as you shine, so to shine as to be a light to others. And again, Mother Teresa, one of the, the best, the most honest, the most honorable souls on this planet. Now, we, we've learned about Mother Teresa that she had days of doubt as well. But it was the overall assurance about God that led her to give her life to something that was great, even if it was personally costly. She's another person who would say, I know whom I have believed it. So there's Sangster's second question. Are these are there a lot of people that report that they know God? Are they dependable? His third 
The third question is this, are the reports consistent? And so um, we could say, yes, because we could, we could talk about the testimonies of Christian men and women who have lived hundreds of years apart and have come from different cultures and different races and uh, different church communions, and, and you'd find a, a coherence to it all. You could take St. Augustine in the 4th century, or you could take uh, Aquinas in the Middle Ages, you could take uh, Martin Luther in the years of Reformation in the 16, 1600s, uh, 16th century, um, you can find Methodists, you can find Independents, you can find Baptists, you can find Anglicans, you could find writers like C.S. Lewis in the Narnia series. You can find people who have been in ministry like Pope John Paul II, the recent uh, beloved head of the Roman Catholic Church. And although they have differences, they have, they hold many things in common and would all affirm the core elements of Christian belief. I ran a, a conference in Toronto at the end of September entitled Being Christian 2016. And uh, the person that uh, kicked off the conference for us, some of you may know him, um, a little fellow by the name of Paul Henderson. And, um, you know, a funny thing about that, when, uh, when I got the committee together to run this conference, um, I, somebody suggested we get Paul to come and open the conference, and um, I said, sure, that'd be a great idea, because I'd heard of him, even though I didn't live in Canada in 1972 when that goal was scored. I, I'd heard of him and heard a lot about him. But uh, there were a couple of people around the table had no idea who he was. They were under 25. <laughs> but anyway, Paul Henderson, he... Um, he opened the conference and he spoke for 20 minutes about what God has done in his life. And he talked about how it was difficult at first uh, when he sort of came out of that proverbial closet and declared he was a Christian uh, and the, the ridicule that he took within the hockey family. Um, but he said, I discovered a relationship with God and that helped me overcome all that. Paul Henderson's another person who could say, I know whom I have believed it. And in that same conference, we had a professor, Anna Robbins, who teaches at Acadia University in Nova Scotia. And Anna startled a few people by challenging the work of biblical critics and commentators that she said had confused many Christians. And she spoke of the historical nature of events around Jesus. And at one point she proclaims, these are not fairy tales that some people are making them up to be. And you could see the people who attended the conference was like, oh, not fairy tales. You know, this Christian thing is different. The history around Jesus is different. And Anna's training, it's in theology, culture, and ethics. There's a PhD from the UK. And yet she too has a faith. A faith that's consistent with the broad tradition of the church. Faith consistent with the broad tradition of the church. She's from our era. And we could speak of other people. I'm going to flash some images up. Remember him? Pinball Clements. Buzz Aldrin, second man to walk on the moon. Desmond Tutu, archbishop, social activist. People from all over the place are saying they have relationships with Jesus Christ. And so there's a consistency to this. There's a consistency to this. They, they can all say, I know whom I have believed. And when you consider this incredible weight of testimony, human beings, they, they can know God. And there are even people in this church that say they know God. I was talking to someone this week and um, told me a wonderful story. And um, she said I could use it, so I'm, I'm going to, but not mention the name. 
Anyway, it was a story from childhood um, some time ago. And uh, the winter, the river, Moira, was frozen. And her dad lost her, his cap on the, on the ice below the bridge. And uh, they, his sister and she felt sorry for, for him. And the next day, she thought she would go and get the cap as her sister watched. Well, went out walking to the middle of the ice and suddenly crack and boom, under. And the current pushed her down. And I think many of us know the danger in that. But you know what she said? She said that um, she wasn't scared because she felt that God was with her and was watching over her. And she managed to find a little pocket of air between water and ice and um, took some much needed air and then crawled her way back to that hole that she had gone, gone in, crawled along the ice. And, um, and then sort of uh, got up onto a bit of a rock and then she said, it was then I got scared. <laughs> That's a tremendous story. Tremendous story. And she said that since then, she has always trusted in God. Tremendous story of trust. There are people here who know God too. And so this morning, if this, this God thing hasn't been clear to you, and perhaps that evidence from St. Paul is distant, maybe when we start to think about it, it's not as distant. That it's something that all people can experience. That the people who do experience it are the very salt of the earth. And when they do experience it, there's a lot of consistency to what's being said. And so, I'm encouraging you this morning to open up. I'm hopeful that you will give God a try. Try to engage God, encounter God, open up those spiritual channels. And maybe it won't be easy at first. But as Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. And if we open to him, he will come in and eat with us. In our openness, God will come. And then we too will be able to say, I know whom I have believed.